to reform ideas for dealing with the crisis more effectively on issues ranging from public health to local governance we had we had our first discussion on the economy yesterday we are staying with that theme today but moving to a more global comparative context because of the extensive nature of the lockdowns announced by governments all over the world businesses everywhere are under severe financial distress and governments everywhere have announced a lot of economic packages to help them tide over the crisis but what's the role of bankruptcy law in all of this that's the focus of today's discussion we have two bankruptcy law academics joining us for today's discussion uh, professor mark ro from harvard law school and dr christian lansweeten uh, from the university of oxford uh, thank you both of you for your time uh, so here's the format for the discussion uh, i'll start with a quick overview of the situation in india professor ro will go next uh we'll talk about the situation in the us followed by dr van sweeten who we'll talk about uk uh we'll then have a discussion among us uh we'll reserve some time for questions right at the end uh if any of you who are listening in have any questions uh please type them uh in the chat box and if i have uh, and if you have time at the end right at the end i'll pick some questions and ask them to the, to the panelist so uh i have a brief presentation to make i'll i'll i'll, I'll share that with you uh, can you see my presentation uh, okay so it's, it's there yeah so uh what's the context so uh even before this crisis started unfolding the the indian economy was in a reasonably bad shape you know consumption levels were low uh, corporate profits and investments were weak uh, some of the core sectors of the economy like the real estate sector and the automobile sector uh, they were in bad shape uh, although credit growth had come down uh, the level of npas the non performing assets in the indian banking sector remained significantly high uh, the insolvency and bankruptcy code is seen as one of the biggest structural reforms in india in you know up you know since our independence and uh, uh, you know it's transformed the landscape dramatically uh, it's you know broadly it's you know it came into force in december 2016 and has been working reasonably well uh, the you know the, it's it's a very simple law Uh, in terms of the process uh, there is a low threshold for entry uh, which is a single default uh, once a case is admitted the management gets displaced by an insolvency professional who runs the process uh, most key decisions are taken by a committee of creditors which comprises financial creditors uh, there are strict timelines in the process uh, uh, there are limitations on the original promoters to come you know come back and regain control so that's the uh, broad process so to speak Uh, in terms of the situation on the ground uh, uh, the the law as i said has been working effectively has been working reasonably well as of march 2020 uh, you know out, out of all the cases that got closed about 50 or percentage of cases ended in liquidation and about 14% cases exited the system with a resolution plan and although on the face of it uh, these numbers especially the resolution numbers might look bad but when you compare this to the situation before the ibc was enacted this is actually a huge shift and huge change and this is actually these numbers are actually really good in the indian context uh, given the fact that the pre ibc regime was practically defunct for all practical purposes uh in addition to resolutions under ibc uh, because of ibc we have also had a significant increase in settlements and out of court restructurings because of the threat of ibc proceedings and the threat of displacement promoters have been more willing to cooperate with creditors to uh, you know to enter into restructuring agreements and settle their debts uh, what are some of the challenges the you know the pendency rates for disposal of some of these cases remained high even uh, before the crisis and there were a lot of uncertainties around plan implementation even before the crisis kind of started unfolding so how has the crisis changed the situation uh, let's look at the economy for first uh, like uh, like in all other jurisdictions the there is a there is a prediction that the gdp in india is going to contract uh, significantly this year there are going to be uh, you know there are losses all across the board in multiple sectors and uh, although the all the corporate india had deleveraged significantly over the last few years uh, 
possibly uh, also, also because of the IBC, which kind of encouraged, which kind of encouraged them to be more balanced with their uh, debt equity ratios. Uh, but the NPA levels, the non-performing asset levels are expected to go up significantly this year. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India came out with its financial stability report last week and it doesn't paint a very rosy picture. Uh, we're expecting a lot of defaults going forward. Uh, and small businesses are, you know, are, 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 are expected to be more distressed in comparison to other regular businesses. Uh, what's been our response thus far? Uh, the Reserve Bank of India, our banking regulator, has announced a loan moratorium program, uh, uh, which kind of allows borrowers to opt in if, if they wish to. Uh, and a significant percentage of uh, borrowers, uh, both regular corporates and small businesses, have availed of this benefit. And uh, so currently, uh, you know, they don't have to you know, uh, make their loan repayments. Uh, that program kind of expires at the end of next month. Let's see what happens after that. The government has also announced multiple liquidity support programs and government and things like government backed loans to make sure that businesses have adequate liquidity. Uh, as far as the IBC itself is concerned, uh, it's been partially suspended, uh, especially for defaults which have uh, occurred on or after 25th March 2020, which was the day on which the lockdown was formally announced. Uh, but very significantly, uh, the threshold for default has also been changed. And uh, although this uh, partial suspension is for a limited period, which is initially for six months and can be extended further, the default threshold has been changed, at least for now permanently, uh, from uh, what was about $1,300 before to more than $100,000. So it's a huge, huge change. So which kind of even without the suspension kind of takes a lot of cases out. And uh, although government can reverse this through another notification in future, but currently this seems to be a big permanent change. Uh, old cases, that is, you know, cases before the crisis started unfolding continue to languish in uh, the, the system. They're still there. And there are question marks on uh, the implementation uh, of, uh, you know, the, the approved plans, the plans that got approved before the crisis started uh, unfolding. Uh, the government has also announced, uh, you know, announced that it intends to come out with a modified scheme for insolvency resolution of small businesses. Uh, uh, I understand that's in the works, uh, hasn't been put out yet. Uh, they've also set up a committee to uh, design a framework for pre-packaged insolvencies. Uh, you know, so that's, uh, that's also uh, you know, possibly under works. Uh, so, so that's been the response thus far. So what are the uh, expectations from the insolvency system? Uh, the debtors, they, uh, they seem to be uh, divided. A lot of debtors are saying that uh, uh, the government shouldn't have suspended voluntary petitions because uh, what the government has done currently is that uh, in addition to petitions initiated by creditors, they've also suspended uh, the possibility of voluntary petitions by debtors themselves. Uh, and some argue that, uh, you know, given the fact that uh, the IBC provides certain protections like a very robust moratorium, uh, you know, the possibility of continued supply of essential services, so on and so forth. Uh, they could have benefited from it if they were given the choice to initiate proceedings on their own. Uh, as far as creditors are concerned, their expectations uh, are uh, quite low from IBC at the moment, uh, largely because of depressed valuations, because they feel that uh, given the current economic environment, they're unlikely to get much value. And therefore, uh, they don't want to, you know, uh, you know, throw uh, good money after bad, so to speak, uh, in this environment. Uh, investors remain upbeat because, uh, you know, uh, the the folks who come, you know, come and you know, uh, take over companies as part of the as part of the IBC process, they think that they can get good assets at good values, uh, uh, possibly at deep discounts, and therefore they are aggressively looking for deals. But uh, currently, uh, there aren't many. Uh, we understand. Uh, so that's, and broadly, you know, they're not, the expectations from the IBC uh, at the moment are not very high. Uh, so what's our proposal? Uh, we believe that the IBC uh, has, one of been, has been one of the most successful uh, law reforms of the government in the recent past. Uh, it should be largely left alone. We understand that we are going through a crisis and possibly the RBI moratorium can't be extended indefinitely. But uh, we believe that the government should let the IBC be, and if you know, if at all any uh, you know uh, 
reliefs are to be provided that should be done through a separate relief enactment uh, a temporary uh, relief enactment uh, you know it should have some basic features of bankruptcy law like you know uh, you know you could you could provide you could have a debtor in possession regime uh, you could uh, you could you know make sure that you have objective entry standards to make sure that only viable businesses enter Uh, and you know also have basic bankruptcy protections like a robust moratorium priority for rescue financing continuity of essential services uh, so on and so forth you could start with uh, small businesses and then or with sectors which are very very uh, distressed at the moment and then see how it can possibly be rolled out in other sectors but let the ibc be uh, you can use ibc and prepacs for other large businesses and uh, you know uh, especially prepacs can be very useful in this environment and uh, if at all you know it comes into force any time soon yeah so that's largely the expectation uh, from the indian ecosystem and uh, now i i will stop share and uh, over to you professor ro for the situation in the us uh just give me a second to see if i can set this up uh should be seeing some slides from me okay good uh so uh, uh thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, share some of my thoughts on bankruptcy in the united states in the uh in the covid-19 uh, 19 era and i'll be interested in uh what you all have to have to say about this um so uh, the general uh question that i thought i'd address is is the american bankruptcy system ready for a covid-19 induced bankruptcy crisis and uh, the answer is mixed um the the substance is probably ready um if uh the bankruptcy system gets overwhelmed with cases uh, there could be a capacity problem um and i'll 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 go into the each one of these uh, a little uh, a little bit more so um okay so um in the run up to the crisis uh the united states had some advantages and some big disadvantages the advantage is the economy was in uh, very good shape uh before the uh, before the crisis um it wasn't it, it isn't that the crisis was piling on to a uh, a weak or uh, or so so economy the economy was strong um corporate debt um as a fraction of the economy was quite high however um uh, pretty much the highest levels that they've uh, that they've been um in some ways this is a residue from the financial crisis of a decade ago um the federal reserve lowered interest rates uh, close to zero um in 2009 uh, and they rose but they didn't rise that much so debt financing has been relatively uh, inexpensive in the united states uh, for the last uh, for the last 10 years um and in reaction to the crisis uh, we didn't think a lot of people thought interest rates could not get any closer to zero than they had been before the crisis but the fed um managed to get that last fraction uh closer to zero in uh uh in in march and uh, kept it that way this week uh so the debt levels as a percentage of uh, of gdp were at record highs coming into the uh, coming into the crisis um and then uh this i guess everybody knows the uh, the the economy um just uh just tanked uh in march uh and april uh, steadied for a couple of months uh came back a little bit um the expectation is that the uh, that the economy will weaken further and that numbers due today will show it to have weakened further um largely because we the united states have been doing such a poor job of controlling the uh controlling the virus This is not a good combination for the bankruptcy system. Uh, a sharply declining economy uh, layered on top of a system that had record high levels of uh, of corporate debt. Um so what should would uh, happen to uh, levels of bankruptcy? Um uh bankruptcies have risen. Um uh they've risen significantly uh, uh up by about 26% uh, in the first half of uh, of the year. and remember the first 3 months were um before the crisis really um hit hard in the United States in uh, in uh, in March and April um I may talk about this a little bit later for a moment or two uh, in some ways the surprise is while this is a very large rise in bankruptcy 26% in 6 months uh in some ways the surprise is so far is why isn't it even higher uh 
And then if there are a few moments, I'll talk about some possibilities as to why it's not even, uh, even higher. Um, what will happen, um, so there's kind of a good news result, which is uh, um, declining in, uh, in probability that the, the virus recedes um, we get a good treatment uh, in, uh, in July or August, which we still don't have. Um, vaccine appears, and we get a few extra bankruptcies at the 26% level, um, but no big strain on the bankruptcy system's capacity. Um, the bad news result would be uh, the, uh, the, the virus doesn't subside. Uh, it persists. Um, the bailout efforts uh, do not keep the economy afloat. Um, they just run out. Um, and there's a significant sharp, turn, sharp downturn in the economy, um, uh, economy that persists. And I'll, I'll stick with the worst case for the next, uh, for the next uh, few slides. Um, I'd begin with the, the worst case for bankruptcy um, would have lots of bankruptcies hitting a bankruptcy system that um, in my view, and I think consensus view among bankruptcy uh, academics, corporate restructuring academics in the United States, it's a system that works pretty well. Um, we all can figure out ways where we think it could work better, um, criticize a judge for doing this or doing that. But functionally, firms go into bankruptcy, um, large uh, uh, firms go into Chapter 11, they restructure, um, and they're out in a matter of months in a restructured, uh, restructured form. The firms don't collapse in, uh, in, uh, in bankruptcy. Um, frequently they're sold now. Um, the level of sales was in the order of 40% of large firm bankruptcies um, for the last year for which there's a good set of, uh, good set of numbers. Um, there's a strong effort to recapitalize debt into, uh, into equity. Um, there are good mechanisms to get new money into firms that are viable if they can just get um, a $30 million, $30 million loan. Um, uh, uh, maybe later we can talk about comparing that to small business, uh, small business bankruptcies. Um, so the question is how well this system could work um, if the court system gets overwhelmed in the next six months to, uh, uh, to a year. Um, and here, I think um, all bets are off. An overwhelmed judicial system will not work as well as it generally uh, generally works. And I'll talk about in a slide or two a couple of the um, uh, a, a couple of the uh, uh, possibilities where the cost could be uh, could be severe. Um, among bankruptcy academics, there seems to be a consensus that the courts have some significant chance of being overwhelmed, um, but that overwhelming hasn't occurred yet. Um, uh, a bunch of academics, including me, uh, wrote a letter to Congress saying, just get ready. Even if we're not appointing new judges and increasing capacity right now, we should get ready for a possible, a possible bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy deluge. So uh, what are the things, uh, well, maybe I should talk about why there could be a deluge. That historically, there's been a strong relationship between unemployment rates and bankruptcy case filings. And you can kind of see this on this graphic, uh, which um, uh, Ben Iverson, finance economist, put, the, uh, put together. And you see the red line is the unemployment rate, um, and the blue line um, is the bankruptcy caseload. Um, that solid black line is, the, is approximately the caseload during the financial crisis, um, when it looks like bankruptcy courts were operating at capacity. They weren't overwhelmed, um, but a bankruptcy judge's work week was easily a 50 hour uh, a week, uh, a 50 hour a week uh, um, workload. Um, and then you see all the way on the right, this uh, extraordinary rise on unemployment in the, uh, in the last few months in the United States. If the old pattern occurs, um, there'll be a, a significant increase in bankruptcy filings in three to six, uh, three to six months. Uh, maybe it won't occur. Maybe the various bailout mechanisms will work. Um, maybe um, reaction to COVID-19 is just different than reactions to other financial uh, setbacks. But if um, the unemployment predictor continues to predict, there'll be a lot of bankruptcies in the next six to nine months. There's one factor that gives the United States bankruptcy system an advantage that you can see on this graphic. So the Blue graphic is the, um, the blue line is the caseload per judge. Um, and you can see coming into the crisis, the caseload per judge was not bad. Um, judges were not operating at capacity in the United States. 
Um, you know, I, I suspect if you asked any judge, they would say how hard they were working, um, but they were not processing as many cases as they were capable of processing in, uh, in 2009. There were some districts that were overwhelmed, but over, uh, over the entire bankruptcy system, uh, there wasn't um, um, uh, uh, a strain on capacity, which gives the United States bankruptcy system um, a little bit of leverage to deal with, uh, to deal with uh, the crisis. Um, so only 26%, um, 26% is a lot. Uh, a few of the reasons why it's not more, a uh, little bit speculative, but um, there was uh, a major and for the United States unusual uh, 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 tendering of $600 for each unemployed person per week. Um, that did a couple of things. One is uh, the people who got the $600 could pay their rent, um, could pay for their groceries, could um, and didn't need to file for personal bankruptcy. Um, different than some uh, other, I think a lot of other countries, the American bankruptcy system is a unified judicial system. Uh, personal bankruptcy, small business bankruptcy, and uh, large public firms all go through the same judicial system. So an expansion of personal bankruptcies constrained uh, constrain the bankruptcy uh, bankruptcy court system. So the people who were getting $600 a week didn't file for bankruptcy because they had enough cash to get to uh, um, get to the uh, get to the end of the month. Um, there were um, some bailouts of industries. The airline industry was ripe for bankruptcy, but they got a significant bailout from Congress. Um, in some localities, there were informal moratoria. Just the understanding was banks will not foreclose on their real estate loans and they will just wait. Um, that might continue, um, it might not continue, but this, these things, if I were speculating, which I guess I am now, these would be the things why I would speculate led to the rise being 26% instead of 76%. Um, also the Federal Reserve, which was an unusual move for the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve started buying up corporate bonds, something it generally did not do in the past. And this gave a boost to the uh, to the corporate uh, to the corporate bond market. Um, so, what are the things that could go wrong if the courts do get um, uh, overwhelmed? Uh, one is just the clogging itself is not a good thing. Uh, one of the reasons bankruptcy works relatively well in the United States is firms can go through Chapter 11 relatively quickly, um, usually in months, not years. Um, occasionally in weeks, and uh, the record was set last year where one firm went through Chapter 11 in less than 24 hours. Uh, unusual, but it does give an, an example of the speed with which these things can be done. Um, uh, so clogging is not a good thing. Um, firms are just, they don't work quite as well in bankruptcy, and the, 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 uh, the genius of the system is that it moves firms through the bankruptcy rapidly. Um, bankruptcy courts really don't do um, macro decisions. So uh, if contracts are being rejected, a feature of American bankruptcy, I don't know for sure if it's the same in India, is that the debtor can reject um, pre-bankruptcy contracts relatively easily. Um, if there's a massive rejection of pre-bankruptcy contracts, that could have some negative effects on commerce generally. And bankruptcy courts don't evaluate whether it would have a massive negative effect. They just look at the firm in front of them. Um, and the third, which is I, I, subtle, but I think potentially um, the most important is the debt overhang problem. Um, with all that corporate debt in the United States, we know that firms with excessive debt will invest less than they would if they had less debt. Um, they'll hire less, fewer people than if they had less debt. And those are exactly the things that an economy that's um, in reverse um, uh, doesn't want to have. We don't want to have firms hesitating from investing and from hiring in October. And if we have a massive bankruptcy wave, uh, that could be the uh, that could be the problem. Um, these are just a little more detail on each one of those. Um, the estimation. Um, I mentioned the unemployment rate. Um, if the unemployment rate is a perfect predictor of um, bankruptcy levels, which thus far it has not been a perfect predictor. Um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the caseload level will rise to be double that which it was in 2009. And bankruptcy judges work hard, but they're not going to be able to work 100 hours a week. They're going to have to start cutting corners. Um, the unemployment rate now is at around 11%. We'll get better numbers in the next week or two. Um, 
during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, the unemployment rate never rose above 10% in the United States. So in terms of unemployment, the United States is in worse shape than it was at the worst of the financial, financial crisis. Um, there are things courts can do to mitigate. This may carry over to India if they're overwhelmed. Um, uh, one bankruptcy institution for large corporations, one bankruptcy mechanism for large corporations in the United States might exist elsewhere. It's prepackaged bankruptcies where the debtor comes into the court with the consents from the creditors already in a package. The package is presented to the judge. The judge reviews um, whether the consents look about right um, and can approve a plan uh, very rapidly. Uh, so if there's an overwhelmed bankruptcy system, courts could move the prepackaged bankruptcies to the front of the line for those firms that can be moved through quickly. Um, for disputed bankruptcies, courts can make more use of mediation. Um, that's a problem actually, in that the people who are usually the mediators are bankruptcy lawyers um, who um, don't have any, aren't representing debtors or creditors at that moment. Uh, the very people who would do the mediation in October, if there's a wave of bankruptcies, are going to be overwhelmed representing clients. So mediation is a possibility in good times, um, but not, um, not so good in, uh, in bad times. So if there's a true overload, there's really no substitute for, uh, for more judges. Um, and uh, the, the problem is, I, may, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, it takes about a year to appoint a bankruptcy judge in the United States. Um, and this could be sped up, but it can't be sped up to weeks or even a few months. Um, it, it really can't be squeezed down to, you know, maybe it could be squeezed down to 10 months, but not much more than that. There are a few reasons for that. I could talk about that later. Um, but this poses a significant decision-making problem for the United States now in terms of bankruptcy. Uh, we might not have an overloaded capacity in um, October or November or the beginning of 2021. But if we wait to find out, we then need a year to get new bankruptcy judges in place. Um, and so there's gonna be a gap if there's, um, if there's a capacity constraint. Uh, so the conclusion, um, just summarizing what I've, uh, what I've said, um, there, have been, there were very high levels of debt in the, uh, in the corporate financial structure pre-crisis, um, which is bad news for bankruptcy. Um, the good news is the economy was in pretty good shape before the crisis hit. Um, the bankruptcy system, the pre-existing bankruptcy system, when there's judicial capacity, um, is pretty good at restructuring firms uh, in the United States. It's not going to be so good if it's overwhelmed uh, with, uh, with lots, of, uh, lots of bankruptcies. Um, and uh, just you know, my judgment is the debt overhang cost is probably the most significant for the economy, uh, for the economy overall. That's it. That's an exploding end. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, professors. Um, uh, several takeaways uh, for the Indian regime there. Uh, you mentioned that you know uh, one of the main reasons why you, current bankruptcy filings are appear to be low is because there have been so many bailout packages, both to individuals and businesses. And once that kind of tapers down it's very likely that the filings will increase. And I think uh, it's possible that we, we might see a similar trend in India as well, because once these, uh, you know, the, the liquidity support programs and loan moratoriums, et cetera, end, that's when we'll truly know the true extent of the problem. Uh, so thank you so much. Now, uh, moving on to you, uh, Professor Van Sweeten, uh, can uh, you can take it from me. Thank you very much, Debancho. I'm just sharing my slides. Can you see them okay? Great. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to, to join you and Professor Rowe to discuss this topic in this valuable series. I'm always amazed at Vidi's ability to put together events and papers at great speed as part of its vision of making better laws. Um, so yeah, it's a great privilege for me to be part of this series. Debanchu has asked me to briefly reflect on three things today. Firstly, the nature of the economic crisis in the UK. Secondly, the insolvency law reforms that have been undertaken in response. And finally, some observations on the overall role of the insolvency system, the legal framework in dealing with COVID-19 related insolvency. So beginning then with the crisis here in the UK, 
As is well known, the UK imposed a lockdown relatively late and perhaps relatedly, the restrictions were imposed for a very long time. So in their fullest form, the lockdown restrictions lasted for about two months, but significant restrictions persisted for a further two months after that. And some still quite significant restrictions re remain in place today. And this combined with COVID-19 related disruptions in supply chains and in demand means that businesses in multiple sectors have had to sustain significant revenue losses. Uh, and the table you can see on the slide, which is taken from some House of Commons analysis of the COVID-19 insolvency reform, suggests that around a quarter of the 6,000 or so businesses who responded to this survey a few weeks into lockdown had experienced a decrease in turnover of more than 50%, and a further 22% or so had suffered a decrease in turnover of between 20 and 50%. Now, it's also clear from survey evidence that businesses do not generally have reserves sufficient to enable them to absorb these losses. And that's particularly true at the smaller end of the market. So you have on the screen a, a screen grab from the Business Impacts Tracker survey, which has been administered by the British Chambers of Commerce over the course of the uh, UK lockdown. So this is a screen grab from the survey that was administered two weeks into lockdown. Um, and 95% of respondents to this survey, which was about 600 or uh, sorry, 1,000 or so businesses were SMEs. And what's interesting about the response to this survey is that 57% of those um, surveyed reported having three months or less cash flow in reserve. And that's allowing for the furlough scheme, which had already been adopted at this point in time. And the UK furlough scheme um, allows businesses to claim back 80% of their wage obligations from the state. So even allowing for this furlough scheme, which had been established at this time, businesses at the smaller end of the market had less than three months cash flow um, in reserve. So putting this together, we could have reasonably expected uh, early on in the lockdown that absent some intervention from the state, we could expect a significant spike in business insolvencies, which again, absent some intervention, would fall to be treated by the pre-pandemic insolvency regime. Now, the state could, of course, intervene to either prevent or cure the distress or to alter the way in which insolvency law treats such distress as it arises. And as we'll see, the UK government has done a bit of both, but its response on the insolvency law side, modifying the prevailing insolvency law, is perhaps more radical than that we've seen in most other jurisdictions. So the UK has significantly altered the pre-pandemic corporate insolvency law particularly in relation to its treatment of viable businesses, what we might call its rescue law, um, in non-temporary ways. And that's the important point. Now, although the UK government has explained these changes as ones necessitated by COVID-19, they're not really explicable in my view without some understanding of what was happening in UK corporate insolvency law prior to the pandemic. And in fact, prior to the pandemic, there was already significant pressure to reform the rescue oriented aspects of English corporate insolvency law. And these are the administration procedure, the schemes of arrangement procedure and the company voluntary arrangements procedure. So there's already a lot of pressure prior to COVID-19 for these aspects of English law to be reformed. And that pressure came from two sources. Firstly, interestingly, from a change in the way the World Bank measured um, it's resolving insolvency uh, index um, in the doing business report. So there was a change in the methodology in the resolving insolvency measure in 2015. Um, it was in, a, in essence a move from uh, measuring only outcomes to measuring outcomes plus features of the law on the books in accordance with uh, quote unquote best practice. And the move to incorporate features of the law on the books as well as the law in outcome uh, affected the UK's ranking. So there was a move from rank seven to rank 13 um, as a result of this change in methodology. And it's clear from contemporaneous uh, policy documents at the time that this change greatly concerned the UK government. At the same time, the experience of the Great Recession in Europe suggested that the rescue oriented laws of some EU member states were not up to the task of avoiding the piecemeal sale of financially distressed but viable businesses. 
particularly at the smaller end of the market. And the result of this in the EU was the first serious push to substantive harmonisation in insolvency law in the EU since the foundations of the European Community Project. And that culminated last year in the passage of a new directive that requires member states to come up to a series of minimum standards in the design of their restructuring related laws. The result is that many member states across the EU have newly introduced restructuring laws, some of which draw on what are regarded as the strongest features of English restructuring law. At the same time, we are about to finalise our withdrawal from the European Union. And this Brexit project, combined with improved quality of the law, at least on the books in other member states, threatens London's status as the restructuring hub of Europe. So with all of this in mind, in 2018, the UK government promised a series of changes to the rescue oriented aspects of English corporate insolvency law. Nothing happened though. These were promised in considerable detail, but everybody, I think, got distracted by Brexit. And it's essentially these changes that have now been introduced permanently through the coronavirus insolvency legislation. And this background is why the changes have taken the form that they have and why uh, most of the changes are permanent. Introducing them in this way though, does make it, I think, quite hard to evaluate their income, uh, their impact, excuse me, both normatively speaking, are these COVID measures? Are they non-COVID measures? Are they both? I think they're both. And empirically, um, because the most significant changes have all been on the cards publicly um, for, for two years or so. So what are these changes? Well, I've summarised them on this slide, dividing them into three categories. Permanent new law, temporary COVID-related modification of the new law, and temporary COVID-related modification of the old law. Um, so the first permanent change is the introduction of what's called a freestanding moratorium of a similar scope to that which you would normally get in administration, obtainable by filing documents in court without a hearing uh, for companies that are or are likely to become insolvent, where an independent insolvency practitioner called a, a monitor verifies that in their view, the moratorium is likely to result in the rescue of the company as a going concern. Once you go into this moratorium, you have to publicize this. It's only 20 days long, but you can extend it through various means with and without creditor consent. Now, normally, as I've said, you can only access this if the monitor verifies that it's likely to result in your rescue as a going concern. But this requirement has been temporarily relaxed um, uh, in relation to COVID-19, um, so that essentially it's enough for you to be able to say that, but for COVID-19, you would be able to satisfy this requirement. The second uh, permanent change is the introduction of constraints on the exercise of rights to terminate or modify contracts for the supply of goods or services by reason of the counterparty's entry into um, an insolvency procedure. Historically, these have essentially been enforceable under English law. That will no longer, that is no longer the case as of last month, unless a court decides that continuation of the contract would cause the supplier undue hardship. Um, but with that exception or subject to that exception, these rights will no longer generally be enforceable. But there's a temporary modification for COVID-19, which suspends the operation of this rule for, for small suppliers. And then finally, we've added to our existing two procedures of schemes and CVAs or company voluntary arrangements, a brand new restructuring procedure, which is based on the scheme of arrangement, which is a very old procedure, but specifically targets insolvency. And for these companies offers companies something more than they could get in the old scheme of arrangement procedure, including most importantly, the ability to have a scheme sanctioned so as to become binding even if there are some classes that dissent. The government has also uh, temporarily modified the pre-existing wrongful trading rule, which is a rule of director liability, and made it much harder for creditors to force a company into winding up on the basis of its inability to pay its debts, which generally speaking under the pre-pandemic law was much easier to do under English law than under Indian or US law. 
Uh, and I think this last change is probably the most similar to the Indian ordinance that's been introduced to suspend the IBC, although the UK government has stopped short of preventing those petitions altogether. So in the next slide, I've tried to visually depict the effect of these changes so that you can see how significant they are. You may also be able to see from this picture that English law is much more of a patchwork affair, lacking the, I think, the elegance of the US or the Indian codes. So this is the pre-pandemic law. Um, under the pre-pandemic law, an insolvent company could go into liquidation, which is a very, or winding up, a very old Victorian collective procedure with a limited stay that only affects unsecured creditors no constraints on the exercise of rights to terminate or modify contracts by reason of entry into an insolvency procedure. So no constraints on so-called ipso facto clauses. Uh, managers displaced and in their place, an insolvency practitioner called a liquidator appointed who has limited powers to trade the business, but does have transaction avoidance powers. And you would usually use liquidation to realize the assets typically on a piecemeal basis and distribute the proceeds and then dissolve the entity. You could also under the pre-pandemic law go into something called administration, another form of collective procedure, but one in which secured creditors are stayed as well as unsecured creditors. Again, in liquidation, the starting point is that managers are displaced and in their place an insolvency practitioner is appointed with the same powers of transaction avoidance as a liquidator, but wider powers of management and sale. And you could use an administration to either achieve a sale to a third party or some form of reorganization. But in the latter case, under English law, you would typically do this by interposing a new company, selling the assets to a new company, which will be owned by some of the stakeholders of the old company. And finally, under the pre-pandemic law, you could use one of the two freestanding restructuring tools, a scheme of arrangement or a CVA or company voluntary arrangement, Neither of these have a stay if you use them on their own, nor do they have any transaction avoidance tools. Um, CVAs could only be used to um, compromise unsecured debt, but a scheme of arrangement could be used to compromise or alter debt or equity rights um, in any class, um, but only where a majority of each affected class agreed. So now we overlay the changes that were um, enacted last month in the COVID Insolvency Act and we see first the addition of the so-called freestanding upstream moratorium, which can be used on its own or in conjunction with another procedure if it doesn't have a stay. The abolition of the right to exercise, uh, the right to terminate or modify an executory contract by reason of the counterparty's entry into insolvency proceedings. And finally, the new restructuring procedure, which we could call a scheme plus, only available to insolvent companies, but featuring the ability to bind dissenting classes as well as members within a class who dissent and constraints on the exercise of ipso facto clauses. So overall, this is the most significant um, set of changes that have been made to English corporate insolvency law, um, certainly since the Enterprise Act of 2002, but arguably for the last century, I would suggest. So finally, Devanshi has asked me to address what is the role of this framework relative to other forms of intervention in responding to the um, COVID-19 economic crisis. Well, the insolvency reforms I've introduced have attracted a lot of attention. And I think that's right because they're far reaching and they're permanent. And we might query whether they're all desirable. For example, I'm not convinced by the addition of the so-called upstream freestanding moratorium, at least at, at first glance. But in COVID-19 circumstances specifically, I'm not sure the insolvency regime is the most important part of the UK government's response, at least initially, to the distress caused by the shutdown. So much of the government's relief has been delivered outside this framework. So directors have been encouraged not to stop trading by the suspension of the wrongful trading rule. Creditors have been restricted in their ability to involuntarily put a debtor into those proceedings. And considerable support has been given to distressed businesses through a very elaborate, somewhat patchwork um, scheme of, of loans and grants. So at least for the first part of the crisis, I would suggest that the most important relief has been delivered outside 
the insolvency framework. And in my view, this is sensible. So with two colleagues in Oxford, we have just finished writing a paper, which will be out in the next couple of days, in which we suggest that um, even in jurisdictions where reorganization laws work well, we are doubtful about their um, immediate application in lockdown scenarios for various reasons. So I think this is a sensible strategy on the part of the UK government. Really, insolvency law's role is ahead, and this is consistent with what Mark and, and Debanchu have already said. So at the larger end of the market, there were there are a number of sectors that were already distressed or teetering prior to the pandemic, and it's clear they will have to undergo major both financial and operational restructuring, for example, high street retail. And these sectors are going to be, I think, um, advantaged by the changes in the insolvency framework, um, and in particular by the addition of this new procedure, which makes it much easier to deal with circumstances in which you have a whole class or more than one class that's dissenting, um, but a restructuring would still be value maximizing. At the smaller end of the market, um, the issue is going to be COVID-19 debt. So de um, loans that have been delivered by the government to, to the smaller end of the market that proved to be unsustainable. And there's a very interesting report um, produced by the City UK a couple of weeks ago, which estimates about a hundred billion pounds worth of unsustainable debt will be sitting there by March, 2021, um, of which 32, I think to 34 um, million pound, a billion pounds was estimated to be sitting in this at the smaller end of the market. Um, so that debt will probably have to be written down or somehow restructured. Um, here, I think the changes to the insolvency framework made by um, the recent legislation are arguably less important. I think much of those is geared to the larger end of the market. But we already arguably had a solution under the pre-pandemic law for dealing with um, smaller businesses um, who need reorganizing in the form of a procedure called a connected party prepackage sale. That practice though is highly controversial. And I think the big question is whether it will be permitted to survive um, once it's used more frequently over the next um, 12 to 18 months. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much to Banshu. Thank you so much, Kristen. So uh, like in the US, uh, in the UK as well, uh, the, the expectations from the bankruptcy system at least you know, at least in the near term, are not really high. And, uh, you know, if at all there is a pileup, it's going to happen later in the financial year. So, uh, you know, but, you know, one of the most striking, uh, you know, features of the recent reforms in the UK is the way in which, from a creditor-driven system, they now seem to have uh, accepted uh, some kind of a debtor-in-possession system, especially the modified scheme, where you know it's like uh, it's 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 a huge change, and I and it's kind of kind of analogous to uh, how the you know Chapter Eleven proceedings in the U.S. work. So how did how you know how was the market kind of seeing this? Because to me it seems like a huge radical change. And was this something that that was being planned even in the lead up to the crisis, or is it the crisis that's kind of kind of changed the political economy completely? Um, so I think this is a really good example of a change that looks like it's crisis driven, but in fact was completely on the cards in 2018 as a result of the two factors that I already mentioned. And the role played by the doing business report here should not be underestimated, which I find very, very interesting. Um, but it's clear that on the books, UK law prior to 2020 did not look like it had a Chapter 11 style reorganisation procedure. In fact, in practice, through a combination of various different procedures, some judge made rules and insolvency practice, we could achieve outcomes similar to what I'm imagining Mark observes on a day-to-day -day basis under chapter 11, but we don't measure well on law on the books measures. Um, so already in 2018, it was clear that there was a desire to move towards this. It is, I agree with you, a very significant change because prior to this year, managers always occupied a quite precarious position. So there was already an option to use a scheme of arrangement or a company voluntary arrangement. And if you didn't go into an insolvency procedure and you just use those restructuring procedures, then managers are not displaced. But there was always a strong threat that you could be pushed into one of those manager displacing procedures by creditors exercising their initiation rights. And what has changed is by the super imposition of that uh, upstream moratorium, managers now occupy a more privileged position than historically. How much of an impact this will have, 
um, depends on two things. One, judicial willingness to extend the moratorium beyond the 20 day initial period against creditor consent. And two, the interpretation of some of the exceptions to the moratorium, which I won't go into detail with now, but some of which are regarded as controversial. And I suppose the broader the interpretation, the wider the moratorium, the more privileged managers positions will be. So, uh, so Professor Rowe, uh, you know, uh, let me ask you, you know, the, the US has, you know, has this debt in position system for a very long time. And, you know, the World Bank uh, indicators also kind of follow the US, uh, although they don't mention debt in position specifically, you know, the parameters are kind of very similar to what the US system provides for. Uh, but uh, is the US system really a debt in position system? Because now it's being seen as a model to be used in a lot of you know, places, especially because of the crisis. And people are actually talking about uh, moving back to uh, a debt and position system in India because of the crisis. There have been some arguments made in the recent past. Uh, so uh, how does it work in the US? What makes it work in the US? Okay, um, well, similar to, the, to what Kristen was saying is uh, the system gets a reputation, but then when you look on the ground as to what, what is really happening, it sometimes uh, is not what the reputation of the system is. Um, and I think that's so for the debtor in possession um, uh, metric for, uh, for American bankruptcy. Um, a little history, most of the debtor in possession rules were put in place in 1978 um, with the bankruptcy code of 1978. And in the 1980s, there was a wide view that bankruptcy for large firms in the United States was not working well, um, that the debtor in possession management of the large public firm would file for bankruptcy and would be in a position to hide out in bankruptcy sometimes for months or, uh, or even years um, uh, and was not a creditor friendly system uh, at, uh, at, at all. And there were a few cases where firms that uh, news reporters would describe as zombie firms uh, would just persist in bankruptcy because there didn't seem to be a mechanism available by which the creditors could reassert control of the uh, control of the enterprise. Um, that changed uh, by the early 1990s, mid, 19, uh, mid 1990s. So in fact, uh, a significant fraction of large firms in the United States are now enter, they enter chapter 11, um, but then they're sold um, pretty much intact uh, in a matter of, uh, of months. Um, they're frequently, they're frequently sold to other firms in the industry. They're frequently sold uh, to distressed debt um, investors, but they're sold uh, 30, 40% uh, percent depending on, on, uh, on how you count this. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any one piece of um, that shows how the system shifted in from the 1980s where the debtor in possession was in control and pushing zombie firms to last much longer than they should. Um, but there are a few things that people add up. And the, the generality is um, the consensus seems to be that creditors uh, found ways to use mechanisms in the bankruptcy code um, to reassert control. Uh, two or three that are relevant, um, uh, firms that file for bankruptcy frequently need a new loan, a debtor in possession loan. Um, the mechanism, probably not unusual for the United States, the debtor in possession, the lender to the debtor in possession um, gets priority over the pre, uh, pre-existing creditors. Um, uh, what debtor in possession lenders have tended to do is they started to put terms into their loan contract saying, uh, if you don't, if the debtor does not make this metric, sales, profits, um, uh, uh, something uh, by six months from now, it must then begin a sales process or the loan becomes due and the firm will um, uh, will disappear unless the creditor takes control. So that was one significant mechanism by which creditors uh, retook control of the process. Um, there were some legislative changes. Um, so one of the pieces that gave debtors in possession management significant control over the process was there's a period of exclusivity in the bankruptcy code in which the debtor in possession is the only player that can propose a plan of reorganization. And that's still there for about four months. Um, the mechanism in the original provision was uh, allowed the judge to extend that period of exclusivity um, ad infinitum. Uh, it could go on forever. 
um, in uh, Congress at the behest of creditors eventually amended that provision with a hard stop after, um, I think it's 18 months now, um, the, there is no right, the judge cannot extend the debtor in possession's exclusive right to propose a plan. Um, and that puts a limit on what the debtor in possession can do, that creditors can say in a negotiation, we'll wait you out the 18 months, um, and then we will propose our, uh, we will propose our own plan um, in a way that they didn't have, uh, didn't have beforehand. Um, the, the third mechanism, which I think has been important, is um, the debtor in possession. Uh, there were difficulties in valuation in the nineteen in the nineteen eighties. Uh, creditors would say the firm is not worth a dollar more than a hundred million. Um, debtors uh, with significant stock positions would say this is clearly a three hundred million dollar firm, um, and judges would not value according to market values. Um, and so there was a great deal of uncertainty as to what the judge would value the firm at if, um, uh, if a plan was, was contested. With the rise of these sale, whole firm sales, um, there was a shift in judicial thinking uh, to the sensibility that the value of the firm is what it can be sold for in a fair, open, and well-informed auction. And that narrowed the level of dispute that was available. If, um, if, a, if a debtor came in and said, we can get, this firm is worth $300 million, um, judges would in some cases explicitly say, well, if this is a $300 million firm, show us the bidder who's ready to pay $300 million. And if you can't show us a bidder or explain why there's no bidder available to pay $300 million for this firm, we don't even have to go through a valuation hearing. We can just tell you right now, judge will say, this is not a $300 million firm and your negotiations have to be predicated on a, uh, on a, on a, on a lower value. Um, so in terms of advice for other countries, I would add that one of the elements that makes um, Chapter 11 work uh, satisfactorily in the United States now is that there is this backdrop of the possibility of selling um, even a very large, uh, in a very large firm, something that I think has already always been in place in the UK and is, in terms of decades, a rel relatively recent development in the United States. Understood. So, uh, you know, that provides a lot of uh, context and, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, sales are not permitted specifically under the Indian bankruptcy code. And I hope that situation changes anytime soon, sometime soon, especially if the law were to change to some kind of a dead end position model. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope that that happens. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we are almost near the end of our time so before us, you know, taking questions from the audience. I want to ask Kristen one more question. Uh, Kristen, you know, another thing about the UK change is the fact that now uh, it's also going to be heavily dependent on the courts, uh, especially the schemes of arrangement uh, framework. And Professor Rowe mentioned that it, in, the in the US, uh, currently they seem to have the capacity. Uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, they might be stretched. But uh, do you see uh, similar issues in the UK as well? Because I'm asking this because uh, you, you know about the Indian uh, ecosystem. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you studied this in detail uh, because I, I fear that if there are a lot, lots of bankruptcy filings in India, say in six or six months from now or a year from now, uh, we will just not have the capacity to, you know, uh, dispose those cases off. Uh, you know, can, what, what's your take on that, both in the context of UK and India? Yeah, I mean, I think as is clear from Mark's presentation, this is a concern for any jurisdiction, not just for, for India, wherever judges have a central role in signing off on how assets are deployed or distributed. I suppose what's interesting about the UK is that judges have an important backstop role, but day to day are not asked or don't have to be asked to do anything um, in the resolution of an insolvency case. So you don't, for example, need a judge to sign off on the sale of the business or assets to, a, a, to either a third party or a new company that's set up to be owned by the stakeholders of the old. So the person who has the ability to ex execute that sale is the insolvency practitioner and no judicial sanction is required for the exercise of those powers. Moreover, English judges historically made clear that they would not 
like to interfere with the commercial judgment of the administrator in deciding to exercise powers of management and sale, and therefore would decline when invited to give judicial blessing to the terms of a particular sale. So it all rests on the um, powers and duties of the insolvency practitioner. Now, from time to time where administrators are doing something controversial, they will go to court um, to ask a judge for directions. Um, which is a form of judicial sanction for what the administrator proposes to do. And I expect there will be more applications for directions in difficult cases in the coming 18 months. I suspect without having any data that there probably is capacity to accommodate an, um, an increase in applications for directions, assuming that many cases are able to be resolved in the way they were able to be resolved previously. But the new legislation does contemplate a more active role for the courts. And so there is a change because now judges will have to police complaints about access to the new upstream freestanding moratorium. They'll have to um, decide applications from suppliers who think it will cause them undue hardship to continue to supply um, because of the new constraint on the exercise of ipso facto clauses. Um, and judges will, of course, have to... Um, convene meetings for and sanction schemes under the new scheme restructuring procedure. But the latter one is probably not going to be huge, would be my guess, because by design and because of the costs of using the scheme of arrangement procedure, I think that will probably be only used by very large debtors. There will be an increase in cases. There probably would need to be some increase in judicial capacity. But I think day to day, it may more be in the first two categories of case that we have um, some backlog that emerges unless um, judicial capacity can be increased. But I haven't done what Mark and his colleagues have done, um, which is get data and do any formal estimate. So this is pure speculation. Understood. So uh, I think let's start taking questions from the audience now. So uh, someone wants to know, uh, Professor Rowe, uh, about, you know, the if you could flesh out the small business bankruptcy uh, piece in the US a bit more as to how does it actually play out? Okay, a couple of things. Um, one is, in terms of timing, there's a new small bankruptcy restructuring act uh, that came into play, uh, became effective around February of, of, uh, of this year. Um, it was not a response to the COVID-19 crisis. It was uh, percolating along um, and just um, just happened for to become effective in February 2000, 2020. Um, it has several features that will make it easier for the small business entrepreneur to, re, uh, to restructure. Um, the, uh, the, the baseline absolute priority rule that creditors must be paid in full before or um, uh, consent to something uh, varying from absolute priority um, is abrogated for businesses that qualify for, under the Small Business Restructuring Act. Um, the firm has to commit to pay some portion of its revenue for the next several years, uh, but it's not a pure absolute priority rule. And some of the other features that gave um, creditors um, some significant leverage in restructuring are eliminated. For example, there's a um, standard provision in, in Chapter 11 has been that at least one creditor class has to consent to the plan of reorganization. At least one creditor class has to think this is a good enough, uh, good enough deal. Um, for small businesses, particularly when there is only one creditor class as the bank, um, this would give the creditor uh, bank significant um, control over the, uh, over the proceeding. Um, this provision is abrogated for small business bankruptcies, making it easier for the entrepreneur to run a firm through bankruptcy. Um, and small, I should say, um, is not microscopic. Um, the original provision was a, a two and a half million dollar business, um, two point seven million dollar business, and uh, one of the COVID nineteen pieces of legislation raised this to uh, to, to seven and a half million dollars uh, business. So it's not; these are not tiny. These don't just have to be tiny, um, uh, small corner uh, uh, food stores. They are medium sized uh, medium sized businesses. Um, there's a general view of what happens for small businesses in the bankruptcy uh, system. Uh, this is not necessarily the majority view, but it's the view I subscribe to, so take it with a grain of salt, which is that for small businesses that have uh, very few parties uh, where it's the entrepreneur, 
a landlord, a bank, um, uh, employees, but the employees are almost always paid weekly and do not become creditors uh, in, the, uh, in the proceeding. There are small enough numbers involved so that the firm, uh, if it's viable, will probably be restructured outside of bankruptcy. And in this view, the firms that enter bankruptcy, the small firms that enter bankruptcy are disproportionately ones in which either the bargaining broke down, um, in which there's a role to restructure, or more frequently that the firm really wasn't viable. Uh, something's happened where people are just not going to that restaurant anymore um, and uh, the, the firm is not a viable firm. Um, and in fact, most small businesses um, that enter, uh, enter chapter 11 end up liquidating uh, in, the, uh, in the United States. The Small Business Restructuring Act is probably gonna change that um, yet to be seen whether it's gonna change it for the better or change it for um, uh, not for the better. Understood. So I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Kristen, uh, someone wants to know if, you know, the new uh, voluntary moratorium, uh, you know, the, you know the, which will be in place for a limited period, what will be the impact of that on financing exact ante? Because obviously that, that's going to have an effect on uh, the loan market in the, in the UK because it, this is a big change. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, if you thought that outcomes were value destructive without it, then I suppose introducing it might have a positive effect on the availability and or cost of credit ex ante. But I'm not convinced we really we had evidence of value destructive outcomes previously. So in which case this might become a way for debtors that were previously best candidates for a quick sale to delay such a sale. Um, if that's right, if value would be maximized by a quick sale and the sale will now be delayed, and if there'll be costs associated with that delay, direct or indirect, then you might expect an adverse impact on the cost and or the availability of finance ex ante. If that's right though, then I guess the interesting question would be how will creditors obviate those risks in advance where they're able to do so and what devices might creditors develop to try to um, mitigate the risk of recourse to the moratorium. Um, and there are various contractual devices that are used under English law um, to try to get um, to try to give creditors control over insolvency outcomes. Um, so I would expect some innovation if if we really do have a concern about a prejudicial um, effect um, ex post, but it's very short, the moratorium. So as I said earlier, really a lot does depend on whether this becomes something more than a 20 day gate, gateway into a scheme or, or a CBA. If, it's, if it becomes a longer term moratorium, presumably the risks of those kinds of ex post costs and the associated implications ex ante are much more extreme. Yes, good question. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, so, uh, you know, several uh, takeaways for the Indian regime there. Uh, the, as, as I said right at the outset, the government seems to be de you know, working on a new uh, insolvency mechanism for small businesses. And I hope uh, the U.S. model, uh, you know, the new U.S. model uh, is something that they may want to look at. But as Professor Rose said, the, the, the success rate in terms of actual resolutions is not very high. And most of the cases have ended up in liquidation. So I but I think, uh, let's see how it kind of plays out in the Indian context. And especially for small businesses, I think in India, the biggest challenge will be uh, how do we keep the cost for resolving bankruptcies down? Because, you know, the cost can't be disproportionate to the size of some of these businesses. And unfortunately, the, uh, the cost for the current bankruptcy process are significantly high. And that's why uh, the you know the small businesses today are largely excluded that's just and that's and and that's why there is this case for a modified system for for them let's see how how that plays out uh, uh, you know a new uh, scheme for pre packs is possibly also on the works we don't know how that will uh, look like so uh, let's see it's uh, it's a, let's see how it actually i don't know whether it will be similar to the us model where they have a pre arranged type of a uh, a pre-pack system or the or the uk model where, where you have more pre pack sales which as you said are more prevalent for small businesses. So uh, only time will tell as to how all of that plays out. Uh, but one thing's for sure, uh, uh, there are going to be multiple bankruptcies in the near future. And uh, 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 and we hope that the bankruptcy systems of our respective jurisdictions have, are able to cope up. Uh, and uh, it's possible that op solutions will possibly come from non-bankruptcy uh, uh, interventions uh, like bailouts because of the extent of this crisis. Uh, but only time will tell. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for your time. It's been lovely having both of you for the discussion. Uh, 
And uh, this also marks the end of our series of conversations around our briefing book. Uh, you know, uh, we believe that, uh, you know, one of, the uni one of the most unique things about, uh, you know, uh, the response to this crisis is the fact, uh, you know, the, the way in which, you know, communities both locally and globally have come together to try and, you know, come up with solutions for addressing some of the problems. And uh, we at Vidhi are also trying to do that in a small way. Uh, and this, uh, our briefing book and this series of conversations was, was you know, an attempt in that direction. Uh, we hope we are able to have some meaningful, uh, be able to achieve some meaningful change in the days to come. Uh, thank you so much again for your time. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and yeah, so stay safe. Thank you.